Ho, ho, ho! That's the most you're going to get. This is the best beard I can put on. Thank you for joining us for the Net Hero Podcast Christmas Special. Drum roll, please. Uh, as you can tell, the weather is a little bit kind of, well, it's beginning to feel a bit like Christmas. Well, not quite. But it has been a hell of a year for the podcast, which started off as purely audio and moved into video, for the stories, for the legislation, for all the things that have happened over the year. Now, I want to thank everyone involved in being on the podcast, particularly Garima, who's on holiday right now. Lazy what's it, but she uh, deserved an early break. She's been putting on all the hard work to get these stories out and doing the research. To Sim Kohi and Rupert, who've been our fantastic team of production people putting it all together. And of course, to you, the viewers, listeners of Future Net Zero and the podcast, and of course, to the people who've come on. There have been so many different speakers across the year, so many different stories, but I wanted to whittle down the top five for me that I thought were great indications of what kind of net zero year we've had. So let's get the countdown underway. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. In at number five. Well, this was a story back in March, and this podcast, we covered the story of antibiotics coming from the ocean. I spoke to Marcel Jaspers from Aberdeen University about some intriguing work they were doing, looking at, at certain plants, bacteria that live in the sea, that we can use to synthesize new forms of antibiotics, but not just generic antibiotics, very specific ones that will work on specific uh, bacteria so that when you're ill, you don't have to take something that applies across the body and knocks your whole immune system out. It was a really, really good uh, podcast. So have a listen to this. If you do the, the statistics uh, for, for instance, for uh, antibiotics and for anti-cancer agents, we can trace back the origin of about 70% of both of those uh, two natural origins. It could be plants, it could be microbes, it could be now also marine organisms like sponges, soft corals, sea squirts, and marine bacteria. That's really interesting. So, but how do scientists find these things actually have these properties then? Because, I, I, you know, unless you're deep down in the water and suddenly feel a bit ill, you think, oh, actually, that sponge might be quite good for me. How does this all come about? So initially, I mean, uh, in sort of the golden age of antibiotics, once they've discovered uh, penicillin, like you mentioned correctly, from, from a fungus, they started looking systematically through soil bacteria and soil fungi. Right, uh, and that was the late forties, early fifties, and into the nineteen sixties, when they discovered most of the antibiotics used today. And what we're doing now is we 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 have two advantages now for that kind of thing. So the first one is that we have that background information, and yeah. secondly, we understand the organisms' genomes and how they produce these compounds. That allows us to do two things: we can either look at the genome and find out whether an organism is going to make something cool and interesting. Yeah, and secondly, um. We can we can predict the chemical structures quite often as well. So that helps us a lot in terms of the search. It's much, much faster than it used to be. And we can find some really unusual chemistry. In at number four, electric cars. Whoa, electric cars have been the thing that have been going on for ages. I've got one. I've done stories about how cool they are to drive and how useless they are when they run out of range. But back uh, in April... I met a scientist and spoke to him uh, called Marcus Spieth from Siemens, who was looking at a different way of decarbonizing transport that doesn't involve electric vehicles. Instead, it involves something called e-fuels or electric fuels. The idea is that the fuel is made by spinning clean hydrogen from renewable sources like wind power and then capturing carbon dioxide and making an e-fuel. This is something that I think, having listened to what he said and looked at it a bit further, could be really, really important. Don't get me wrong, I think EVs are probably the way to go, but we've got plenty of cars sitting here that run on some form of petroleum fuel. Now, what if we could keep them going using a similar form of fuel, but much cleaner, rather than having to scrap them? So I think e-fuels 
have a lot a bigger role to play in net zero than people give them credit for. And my chat with uh, Marcus was really, I think, quite revealing. Yeah, the E stands for electricity-based fuels. That means the, the energy uh, which is in these fuels is coming from renewable electricity. That could be wind or it could be solar energy or hydro energy. So this electrical energy from renewables is converted into hydrogen in the first place and then uh, through electrolysis. And then the hydrogen is being converted into derivatives like uh, methanol, gasoline or kerosene. Um, do, yeah, just a quick question there. So uh, people have heard of, you know, wind wind power generating hydrogen and there, there is a separate debate about kind of how energy efficient that is. But when you look at uh, creating these e-fuels, my, my basic thought was, and I, I might be wrong here because I'm not an engineer or, or a chemist, do, don't fuels have to involve some form of carbon? Don't they have to, like, you know, a methane element or whatever? So... How do you go from hydrogen to making a, a fuel that can run in a car for for an ICE car? Exactly. We need to add CO2 to the hydrogen in order to make fuels. Ah. Because it's uh, Actually, it's the same substance, the gasoline or kerosene or methanol we're producing is very similar to the existing fossil fuels in its chemistry. Uh, so we need to add CO2. And it, it's important to... to uh, use sustainable CO2 to add it to this, to uh, have a carbon neutral cycle at the end. So first we capture the CO2 from the atmosphere and then we re release it again at the end. So we have a carbon neutral cycle. So just to get this, you, you use uh, say a wind turbine to, to make the hydrogen. You capture the carbon nearby, uh, the carbon dioxide from the air, and then you combine it all together and you produce a fuel which is effectively the same as a fossil fuel in terms of its uh, energy density and efficiency? Exactly. The The benefit of this uh, synthetic fuels is you can uh, be a bit more creative in the, uh, in, uh, the composition so we can avoid uh, particle emissions and, and other emissions which you typically have with, uh, with fossil fuels. But uh, in terms of their norms and specification, it's it's fully capable to run in the existing car fleet. In at number three, well, this was the year that nuclear got branded sustainable. Do you remember this bit? Increasing nuclear capacity is vital to meet our net zero obligations. So to encourage private sector investment into our nuclear programme, I today confirm that subject to consultation, nuclear power will be classed as environmentally sustainable. That's right. That's when uh, the Prime Minister said that nuclear fuel and nuclear in general is a sustainable part of the green economy. Now, a lot of people disagreed, but it was all about how you make sure that we go to a lower carbon future. And uh, in May, I spoke to Stefano Buono from a company called Nucleo, who were looking at exactly that, making nuclear energy much, much cleaner. Because obviously, although the, the fuel generates power that's clean with no carbon, there's a huge amount of carbon that goes into building these things. And of course, what do you do with the waste? Well, what if you could make sure the waste that we have from nuclear fuel isn't radioactive at all? Let's say to make one gigawatt electric, you have to extract more or less 200 tons of uranium from the heart for one gigawatt electric for one year. It's a, not a lot of material, but still, it's important. Then you have to enrich this uranium. So you create a 24 tons of fuel. Of this 24 tons of fuel, what you really transform is only 900 kilograms. So out of the 200 tons that you have extracted from her to make a nuclear fission in these modern reactors, you only consume 900 kilograms. So your real nuclear waste is 900 kilograms and are the product of this fission. So light elements, 
that remain radioactive for a while, but then they, they lose this radioactivity. So the waste is uh, the most dangerous part of the waste comes from the fact that today's reactor don't fission all the uranium, but create also elements that are heavier than the uranium. Right. The most known is plutonium because it's been used to make the bombs. Yeah. And also because its lifetime is 250,000 years. And most of these uh, elements last for so long. That's why you associate nuclear energy to a big problem of waste because you have radioactive material, very toxic, that remains for so long, for hundreds of thousands of years. And so the only solution is put it underground. Yeah. And uh, not many countries in the world have taken the decision. Finland is building an underground facility to store the nuclear waste, but not many have taken this decision because it's also very cold. We take, uh, our idea is to use, reuse these uh, 200 tons per gigawatt produced 200 times because we want to to burn all of it so we can transform all of this uh, material into into waste. So to make uh, out of this uh, extracted uranium, use it for 200 years, not for one year to produce one gigawatt. And at the end, yeah. not having all of these very long-lived elements, only these fissure fragments that after 250 years have completely disappeared. The radioactivity is no more there. So that's what we want to do. At number two, after we changed to being sort of video as well as audio, I spoke to Julia Hales. Now, Julia is someone I was very, very impressed with because, frankly, she's been doing this for 30, nearly 40 years. She was part of the team that published the Green Consumer Guide back in the early 80s and has been a campaigner who's always said that we need to work with business to go green. I caught up with her to look at how she got into this in the first place, what stimulated businesses to get involved, and how she thinks things are going nearly 40 years on. In particular, what we recognised is that so many of the issues came down to what they were doing and the fact that they would say, businesses, there's no demand for yeah. greener products. Mm. Why should we be doing anything? So we recognized that actually we were appealing to consumers because people were thinking, what can I do? And then we were helping them with the ideas. And at the same time, we were then saying to businesses, people are concerned, you need to be paying attention to these people and these are your customers. And we did surveys at the time showing that there were obviously some deep green people who were always going to be doing a lot, but there was a huge swathe, and this was sort of proper market research, there was a huge swathe of consumers who really wanted to do something but didn't know what they could be doing. And we caught that zeitgeist. If we hadn't written it, somebody else would have done because there were lots of people there. And after we, we had the success with the Green Consumer Guide, it wasn't us approaching business. It was the other way around. They swarmed to us and they came and they said, look, we realize this is important. What on earth do we do about it? We started advising them. We're doing environmental audits, doing life cycle assessments of their products and essentially looking at what they could do to change the focus of their business to put environment much more, much further up the agenda on a par John developed a marvellous term called the triple bottom line, looking at financial, environmental and social impacts. And that became a very standard thing that businesses started picking up on and recognising they had a responsibility on all three fronts. Do you think there's an impetus on finding ways to communicate better, particularly for businesses, to avoid the greenwashing, to be accountable, but also for us as consumers so that we don't follow a TikTok trend or things like that, particularly young kids. They believe so much without ever looking to see anything verified, a rumour. Does that worry you that the way that the information, because change comes from knowledge, knowledge comes from understanding, and if where we're getting our understandings wrong, then our impression of what we should do is wrong. I totally agree with that, and yes, it does worry me because I think that people take a very simplistic approach. So if you take the whole issue of plastics, um, I, I really, in, in some ways, I sort of welcomed the fact that there was a huge amount of awareness about waste because we are an incredibly wasteful society and there are terrible things that are being done. But it drove me completely mad that everyone used to just say, ban plastics, get rid of plastics and everything. Absolutely. That would be a monster. Plastics are a lightweight material. They're a miracle material in all sorts of ways. If we ban plastics, the amount of energy we'd use would be 
far, far greater. So, and the main issue with plastics, there, there are a few, but the main issue with plastics is getting into the waterways. Of so course. shouldn't we be really looking at what are the things that are getting plastics into our waterways? Not designing plastic so it's all right if it gets in our water, because we don't want it in there in the first place. And by the way, biodegradable plastic will not biodegrade in the sea because it's too cold. So there are all sorts of things that, you know, we have all these misperceptions about, you know, what to do. And the same for... Uh, disposable plastics is that, that effectively if you actually recycle them and you use recycled materials there's got to be a market for recycled material yeah. as opposed to virgin material that's really important so the circular economy going keeping within the system is 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 really important that's what my son's business is all about rubbish ideas is helping people move towards that circular economy but in many ways it can actually be better than reusable containers so if you take a festival or event Sometimes they're doing, you know, reusable cups and they're yeah, saying this is yeah. so much better. They do, yeah. they, some of them have been sending those cups abroad to get washed. Has anyone ever thought about what that might mean? What a carbon footprint. Yeah. What a carbon footprint that is. Some of them have reusable containers, but how many times are they actually reused? And, how, and they have to be heavier in order to make them. So if they're not used enough times... That's not any good either. People take them away as souvenirs because they put a yes. date on them. What's yeah. the point of that? <laughs> um, so there are all these different things. And that's, in a way, the biggest point I want to make in relation to this thing is that so many of the things we need to look much more holistically at the impacts of what we're doing, whether it's flying, whether it's planting trees, whether it's about plastics, we need to be have a much more sophisticated understanding. And I think the role of business is to properly research these issues, make sure they truly understand them and lead the way towards the solutions that are innovative, bold and properly factually going to make a difference environmentally because we are in a crisis and we need proper action and business is in an excellent place to be a leader in, on this front. And finally, number one, well, I suppose in the year where we talk about net zero, it had to be the man who set net zero into action in this country, Chris Skidmore, now soon to be a non-MP, but obviously the man behind Mission Zero, the government report that he produced with loads of recommendations saying how we have to take the UK to net zero by 2050. Now, Chris has been doing the circuit, speaking to people, as he prepares to step down, as I said, from being an MP. But his ambition is to continue to be involved in Net Zero. And we caught up towards the end of the year in November to discuss how he thinks the government is doing now with some of the rollbacks that have happened in policy, what the global financial situation means for Net Zero, and whether he believes we will hit that 2050 target. Yeah, we still have millions of people living in rubbish housing that's falling to bits the you know, with no insulation. And this is not necessarily a net zero challenge. No. It's a basic challenge around the fact that, you know, things fall apart, you know, cars fall apart, houses fall apart. You've got to be able to upgrade things you know, as you go through uh, time. And net zero is, is allowing us to sort of say, look, status quo, the present, you know, isn't acceptable. And it helps put a new lens on this as well. So I think it's, it, it's normalizing it in the everyday sort of conditions of, of people is really important. But then also, how do you create those the legislative structures, the regulations that outlive politicians? And I think we've seen that you know, with our Climate Change Act, our carbon budget processes. We just need to see more of this. And I think you know, I campaigned for Ofgem to have a net zero duty I met with the CEO actually yesterday to talk this through. And it's like, how do we ensure that, like, we're like with the NHS, we ins we give more powers to pro the professionals. And it comes back to the point around the scientists, the engineers, yeah. the ones who know how to do the transition. How do we make sure that they're empowered to get on with it? And so the Net Zero Review was commissioned by government to tell government you know, what they need to do to make Net Zero happen in a more affordable way, how actually getting on with the job will cost less. If you, if you kick the can down the road, it's only going to cost more. And delay you know, will mean that sort of ultimately it, you know, taxpayers will be on the hook for that. Chris, is government listening? I think you know, out of those 129 recommendations, I, I think I've counted up that the government has agreed to 70 with a timescale that I set. They agreed to another 30 but not with the time scale I said. They disagree with about 29 recommendations. I think the government's guilty of green hushing at the moment. They're actually doing some great work. They're just no, not they are. They are. proudly 
advertising what they're doing, which is a, a tragedy because we could still be leading internationally on showing actually the UK is a leader. And actually, it's not due to politicians that they're a leader. It's due to businesses and industry and the energy sector. You know, this is something that we should be proud of because actually Britain is leading. We've decarbonized by 50 percent. We're half of the way there. We've actually grown our economy by 70% at the same time. And that's down to business. It's not down to necessarily the politicians to take the credit. And we should actually get out there and champion and say thank you to those who've managed to actually achieve what they achieved and then listen to them about what they need to do to get to the next half of the journey. You're not going to stand as an MP after the next election. Uh, you tell me you're committed to this. What is your hope? Well, my hope is that I still remain somebody who's able to articulate what is needed. I'm still intending to work on policy, if not you know, being a politician. That's why I went into politics, was for policy reasons anyway. So expect me to still sort of publish reports, books. I also think that the frameworks are, are in place now, that I want to actually be part of the, the, the job of getting on with it. You know, I've, I've had 14 years as a politician where I've been able to talk a lot, and I quite like to now so, be time able to do to something then, Chris. Is that right? Do something about it. <laughs> and you know, net zero is there for 2020, 2050. We've got 27 years. You know, I'll hopefully still be around come 2050. And I want to be able to see out that opportunity in the next 27 years to actually make sure this happens. So that's it. Five of the stories I thought were great from the podcast that showed you a little bit more about what happened this year. There are plenty more, so many favourites. I could have got them in. There was a great story about kind of how we can make clothes out of carbon. We had a story about finance, loads of things on net zero homes, EVs, emissions from cars. So please have a look at the back catalogue of podcasts. We've got so many stories to tell you. And we've got plenty more coming up in 2024. So I do hope you have a fantastic Christmas. Happy New Year from myself and the whole team here at Future Net Zero. Keep tuning into the podcast. If you want to be on it, then get in touch. NetHero at futurenetzero.com. We'll catch you in the new year where we'll keep on striving to tell you stories that you'll find interesting, challenging, and all about getting us to that big net zero target. Have a great one. You've been listening to the Net Hero podcast with Summit Bose from Future Net Zero. Visit our platform for all things Net Zero. And if you or your business is doing great things on the path to Net Zero and want to be featured on the podcast, email nethero at futurenetzero.com. Follow us on social media. futurenetzero.com. Better business, better planet.